Welcome to the UNSCAP online course for negotiating regional trade agreements for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. My name is Katrin Kuhlman, and I'm a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and the president and founder of the New Markets Lab, a law and development center. This is module nine on development. Development is an important and overarching issue. We have touched upon it already in some of the other modules related to RTA provisions on specific issue areas and ways in which they could be tailored to the needs of developing and least developed countries. This module will focus on development as a whole, looking at different aspects of development that are incorporated into RTAs and beginning a discussion on how these could be considered even more deeply going forward. Developing and least developed economies were those most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. UNCTAD reports that the most vulnerable groups in these countries were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And a recent UNDP study highlights that the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting economic implications could drive over 1 billion people into extreme poverty, falling far short of the UN SDGs. RTAs can and do include provisions to address the needs of developing countries and LDCs, and these could also be tailored better to challenges arising from crisis and pandemic. The WTO and RTAs reflect a differentiated approach to development. The focus of the handbook chapter here is on provisions covering special and differential treatment. And we also touch upon the recent trend to incorporate sustainable development into RTAs. Further focus on this could be incorporated into future versions of the handbook. Before turning to how RTAs address aspects of development, including special and differential treatment, it's important to have a sense of the legal foundation for development in international trade rules. Development comes up throughout the WTO covered agreements, including in the WTO preamble, which references different aspects of development, including sustainable development. To a degree, this has influenced WTO priorities, although many would argue that it hasn't influenced them enough and it has also appeared in WTO jurisprudence, such as the shrimp turtle case. Special and differential treatment provisions, including those aimed at increasing trade opportunities for developing country members, provisions under which WTO members should safeguard the interests of developing country members, flexibility in commitments, action, and use of policy instruments, transitional time periods, technical assistance, and provisions relating to LDC members are how development tends to appear in WTO covered agreements and RTAs as well. There are several provisions worth noting. One is part four of the GATT, which enshrines the principle of non-reciprocity, departing from the general non-discrimination and reciprocity principles to address the needs of developing countries and LDCs. Another is the enabling clause, which also encompasses non-reciprocity and provides the legal basis for the Generalized System of Preferences Program and duty-free quota-free preferences for LDCs, as well as for South-South RTAs. Article 4 of the General Agreement on Trade and Services on Increasing Participation of Developing Countries also includes provisions related to development and special and differential treatment, including Article 4.1c, which aims to facilitate the participation of developing country members in world trade by liberalizing market access in the sectors and modes of supply that are of interest to them. And of course, special and differential treatment provisions come up throughout the WTO covered agreements, as we will reference in the discussion here today. Regional trade agreements also address development considerations to a degree, often in their preambular language or through specific special and differential treatment provisions. One recent example is the African Continental Free Trade Area, which includes specific SDT provisions and flexibilities in the protocols on trade in goods and trade and services, as well as in the preamble, taking into account the special economic situations and development trade and financial needs of the parties on a case-by-case -case basis. RTAs have also included broader development chapters, such as environment and labor that link to the SDGs and other international commitments. Labor provisions in RTAs most frequently reference the ILO 1998 Declaration on the Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. With respect to the environment, references are made to the major multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Kyoto Protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change 
Convention on Biological Diversity, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, and Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. Other RTAs have included standalone chapters on sustainable development, which is a new trend. These include the EU Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, the EU Singapore Trade Agreement, and the EU Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. So this chapter begins to assess how RTAs can incorporate development options for responding to crisis. And I would say that this is one area in which the handbook is really just a start. It is meant to be a document that can be added to over time. And this is an area that does deserve additional focus. So at present, RTA options tend to focus on differentiating among countries with particular needs, such as different categories of developing countries and LDCs, transitional time periods for the implementation of commitments, which we have seen already in areas like intellectual property rights, and capacity building. In addition, as noted, provisions on sustainable development are becoming more common, although this is still a new trend. So with respect to RTA options on differentiating among countries with particular needs, the handbook highlights three possibilities. One is the baseline, which is taken from the preamble to the Marrakesh Agreement and recognizes the need to allow develop, developing countries and LDCs the ability to participate in international trade to the fullest extent. The baseline plus option is taken from RCEP and it identifies a specific group of countries for which SDT needs should be extended. It also focuses on the benefits to LDCs through their participation in trade and investment agreements. And baseline plus option B is taken from the AFCFTA. It provides for a differentiated approach, recognizing factors beyond economic considerations that should render some countries preferential treatment for trade in goods and services. This more differentiated approach seems to be the trend right now. The WTO covered agreements do not define developing country, although they use the, the definition for LDC derived from the UN measurements. But it seems that trade agreements are starting to go a bit beyond this and find other ways to differentiate between economies in order to really tailor provisions to their needs. So the baseline plus option B from the AFCFTA is included here. And it notes that state parties shall provide flexibilities to other state parties at different levels of economic development or that have individual specificities as recognized by other state parties. These flexibilities shall include, among others, special consideration and an additional transition period in the implementation of this agreement. And here we also see language from the AFCFTA Protocol on Trade and Services, noting that state parties may grant flexibilities, such as transitional periods within the framework of action plans on a case-by-case -case basis to accommodate special economic situations and development, trade and financial needs in implementing this protocol for the establishment of an integrated and liberalized single market for trade and services. Transitional time periods are also a common form of special and differential treatment. And these do tend to be incorporated into RTAs just as they are incorporated into the WTO covered agreements. So here the baseline option is taken from the WTO covered agreements in particular the WTO TRIPS agreement, which provides for blanket transitional time periods for developing country and LDC members. As we discussed in the, in the module on IPRs, most of these transitional time periods have expired, although several do remain in place for LDCs. The baseline plus option noted here is from the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, which is illustrative of differentiated implementation with tailored transition periods based on country needs. And the TFA follows the categories of A, B, and C measures that countries can implement upon signature, measures that require more time, and measures that require more time and capacity building support. The baseline plus option B in the handbook is taken from the WTO SCM agreement and provides for differentiated transitional time periods to phase out subsidies that are contingent upon export performance and the use of domestic over imported goods. This can be also be seen in the box on the slide. Another central aspect of special and differential treatment, and one that is particularly important in the context of crisis and pandemic, is capacity building and technical assistance. 
A number of institutions like the WTO, UN, and World Bank provide this kind of support, of course, and RTAs are also increasingly incorporating provisions on technical assistance and capacity building into their agreements, both as part of institutional provisions and in specific chapters on labor, environment, trade facilitation, and customs. The baseline here is taken from the WTO TFA, which provides for a comprehensive approach to providing technical assistance and capacity building support in trade facilitation, differentiating between different needs of different countries as noted already. And this is a model that will likely increasingly find its way into RTAs. The baseline plus option here is from the Pakistan-Malaysia FTA, and it addresses capacity building in its custom cooperation chapter and specifies the forms that such support can take, including how support can be extended in different sectors. The baseline plus option B from the EU-Morocco FTA is also included in the box at the bottom of the slide. It sets out specific types of cooperation across sectors with varied forms of assistance and capacity building, including the transfer of technical know-how as appropriate, which has been an important consideration. And then there is a discretionary option, the Japan-Malaysia FTA which conditions cooperation on the availability of resources and provides a less firm commitment to capacity building and one that could both create policy space but also particularly disadvantaged stakeholders. And finally, we turn to sustainable development in RTAs. There is a recent trend to incorporate sustainable development into RTAs in line with the SDGs. This could take the form of provisions in a preamble. It could also take the form of a sustainable development chapter, such as what the EU has been doing in some of its recent RTAs. And it's important to keep in mind that with respect to sustainable development or other chapters related to development aspects like labor and environment, that the precise scope and nature of relevant RTA provisions is carefully considered in order to ensure that development and not veiled protectionism results. The EU approach has been to take on three particular characteristics. One, sustainable development chapters seek to promote effective implementation of international labor conventions and MEAs. Second, the EU's sustainable development chapters seek to establish a level playing field by not lowering environmental and labor standards with the aim of attracting investment addressing the so-called race to the bottom. And this is perhaps a place where the balance that I just mentioned really needs to be considered. And third, sustainable development chapters advocate for the sustainable management of natural resources. Short of a standalone RTA chapter on sustainable development, sustainable development can be or incorporated into RTAs in other ways. RTA options are provided by below, which we'll discuss briefly. And there's also a new agreement on climate change, trade, and sustainability, the ACTS Agreement, which is currently under negotiation among Costa Rica, Fiji, Iceland, New Zealand, Norway, and Switzerland, which is expected to establish rules that remove tariffs on environmental goods and include binding commitments on environmental services, among other substantive provisions. So here the baseline option is really taken from the Marrakesh Agreement's preamble. This includes non-binding language in the field of trade and development, allowing for the optimal use of the world's resources in accordance with the objective of sustainable development. And the baseline plus option is taken from EFTA Indonesia and reaffirms the commitment of the parties in achieving the UN SDGs. There are other examples in other RTAs as well, which are contained in the handbook. So finally, here are the two baseline options discussed in the previous slide. One is the language from the Marrakesh Agreement preamble that focuses on sustainable development, and the optimal use of the world's resources in accordance with the objective of sustainable development. The second is a baseline option B, taken from the EFTA Indonesia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement preamble with a reference to the UN SDGs. Either of these could be used as a baseline, and there could be a baseline that combines the language in these two. In addition, however, much more focus will be needed on what could fall into a sustainable development chapter and how that could be used as a way to address some of the needs arising from the current pandemic 
and to build forward better.